everyone. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is Ben Wilkes. I'm the program manager at um, TomTom Foundation. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we want to thank our sponsors. First of all, um, Seville Weekly sponsored this program. We're very, very grateful um, for their support. Um, the title of today's session is Demystifying Defunding Visions for a World Without Prisons and Police. Um, I'm happy that you're all here today to talk about this with us. Um, I'm joined by um, Dawn Blagrove, who's the executive director of Emancipate North Carolina, and Jasmine Heiss, who's the campaign director of In Our Backyards at the Barrett Institute of Justice. Um, structure of today's session, we'll have a um, conversation between Dawn and Jasmine. Um, that'll last about 30 minutes, up to 45, and then we'll give you all the opportunity to break into small groups, um, to talk about the issues at hand and to hopefully come up with some creative solutions and ideas. Um, we'll have a survey to kind of accompany you in that process. Um, and we hope to collect um, some of the ideas of the group and um, serve that back to you all um, once we have a chance to compile them. So um, thank you again, as you, as you probably know, this is a part of a seven week series. Um, and um, this is the end of the week focused on criminal justice reform. There's one more session this afternoon at, at 2 p.m. around um, reentry service, services for the formerly incarcerated. So we hope you can join us for that as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jasmine. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, and, and echoing the thanks for being here this morning after, I think, another difficult night for many people in America, um, particularly Black folks and people of color to talk about what has been top of mind for, for so many of us in the past several months and for many of us in the past several years and decades, which is you know American policing and the broader criminal punishment system. Um, as Ben said, I lead the Inner Backyards Initiative at the Vera Institute of Justice. And our work is sort of broadly focused on the catastrophic rise of mass incarceration and punishment outside of major cities. Uh, we often talk about jails as the, the front door of mass incarceration, but to torture that metaphor, if jails are the front door, then police are really the gateway to this system. We know that inside every police encounter, as we have seen over and over again on our Twitter feeds, on our phone screens, on the news in the past several months, lies the threat of, of escalation injury. And for too many people, particularly Black people in this country, the threat of death. We also know that beyond that initial encounter for the millions, tens of millions of people who are booked into jail each year and go to state or federal prison, that that vulnerability to premature death and to harm doesn't go away. It just becomes less visible behind prison and jail bars. So here to, to talk with me this morning about what it means to ask for defunding of this massive system of punishment and control, um, a system that costs taxpayers and families $182 billion each year, is the brilliant and inimitable Don Blagrove from North Carolina, uh, the executive director of Emancipate North Carolina, with whom I have had the, the pleasure of working and, and watching her leadership and her brilliance. Um, and, you know, we, we have lots of questions. We want to help demystify defunding for all of you. But I, I think I would invite us just at the beginning to take a, a minute of silence to honor Breonna Taylor's life before we begin after last night's verdict. Um, so with that, I think I'm, I'm just going to close my eyes and, and give it a minute.
thank you all for that and I'll invite you to come back sort of as slowly or as quickly as you'd like to to the conversation. Um, and, and coming out of that, you know, Dawn, I'm going to go off script for a moment for, from what we talked about before, because so much about this moment in our lives is, is, you know, consistently and constantly reacting to change, to crisis, to unprecedented challenges. Um, and I wonder if you could share a little bit with us about, you know, where you are this morning in the light of, of last night's decision with these broader calls to defund the police and to to rethink and reimagine and dismantle this larger criminal punishment system, you know, how should we be thinking, I think, specifically about holding up Breonna Taylor's life in this moment? And, and how do we specifically center these stories around Black women who are so often not included in the conversation or not centered in the conversation about police violence? Uh, first, I want to say thank you for having me here. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here ask, and asked to talk about this subject, especially um, in this moment. First, uh, as a mother of a 21-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old daughter, um, my heart absolutely um, aches for uh, Breonna Taylor's mother and her family and for what, specifically as a mother, what she's lost and what she lost back in March and she's been dealing with since then. Um, and, and I want to humanize it a little bit because as a mother of daughters, what she lost was not just a child, right? What she lost was weddings and grandchildren and um, watching her daughter grow into an adult who would become her friend, um, helping her maneuver the world in a way that um, that is not designed to honor her or to love her or to cherish her. So. Uh, and I'm sorry, y'all, I'm going to cry a little bit. Um, so I first want to acknowledge that loss because it is profound. Um, but then to have that loss compounded uh, by a corrupt and rotten system that tells you that your baby that the death, that the murder of your child um, was not only uh, okay, but was not even worth asking a jury to convict anyone or hold anyone responsible or accountable for her death. Um, and then to have charges brought for what essentially is tantamount to property damage. But even that property damage is not related to the loss of your own baby. Um, yeah, it made me angry yesterday. Um, Black women lives are not valued. Um, and this system is one that we have got to dismantle. And, and let me be clear. I'm an attorney, so I spent a good amount of time investing in the system that we have, thinking that this system could be reformed, thinking that this system could be tweaked, thinking that this system could be fixed. I am solidly no longer there. This system um, has to be torn completely down and reimagined. Uh, and from the ashes of this current racist system, we need to talk about and be about building something that is fair and that is equitable and that serves whole communities and whole people. Uh, and so it is the spirit, it is from that spirit, it is from that place 
that I want to have this conversation about policing and the role that it plays in a corrupt carceral system that um, that has to be torn down. Thank you for for going there with me this morning and and for your vulnerability and, and your honesty. I think you know that tension between so many of us who who work sort of incrementally day to day to try to reform the system and that bolder vision for dismantling, rebuilding. Um, you know, I think at the heart of that for a lot of people and what I'm seeing in this moment, that tension is people say, well, you know, it's a few police officers, we can improve training, we can take X, Y, Z, this push to reform, I think is, is often divorced from or fails to acknowledge the longer history of policing in America. Uh, and I know you think deeply about this history, about the way in which police have been used as a, a tool of white supremacy, a tool to manage and in many ways maintain inequality. I wonder, you know, if again, to help sort of ground us on, on in why, why have you moved away from reform? Why is that not simply enough? What is the history of American policing that we should be cognizant of and thinking about that? So the history of American policing is um, deceptively simple. <laughs> Um, but it is intentionally and purposely obfuscated, um, molded into something different. In America, policing has become like a religion in the way that it, that people wholeheartedly accepted, um, wholeheartedly accept the, uh, narratives about law enforcement without question, without without um, the faith that we have in law enforcement to despite <laughs> the fact that we have seen over and over and over again that they do not deserve um, is something that we, that we have to tackle, that we have to overcome, that we have to think critically about. Um, while, while God or whomever your your spiritual being is or whatever your religious center is, or even if you have none, um, that rests on a on a belief that we have that we have faith without seeing. Um, but we don't we can see what law enforcement is doing. And because we can see, we know that they aren't deserving of the faith that we put in them and they don't bring about the changes or the sense of security um, that we have so fundamentally invested in them. So the history uh, of policing is this. Policing in America has its roots in chattel slavery, uh, in slave patrols, in controlling Black bodies. Uh, even when um, it evolved after the end of slavery, when policing evolved from slave patrols um, and evolved into something different as, our, as we shifted from chattel slavery to Jim Crow laws or to black codes and then the Jim Crow laws, um, policing became then what it had always been. But policing has always been at its root about less about crime and more about controlling societal influences, more about making sure that the people, the have-nots are contained in a way that is protective and coveted of the haves. So policing once it evolved in America was less about crime and fighting crime and more about controlling black people, immigrants, the poor, working class, and keeping them and controlling their movements, controlling their actions, controlling their thoughts, um, suppressing uprisings, suppressing uh, individualistic thoughts, but most importantly, suppressing any action or movement that would threaten the ruling class. That is the, that is the fundamental purpose of police in America. Uh, because of that, the history of policing is that um, most of these folks 
who when his when policing was started there was absolutely no training they were mostly white men um and any white man who decided that they wanted to commit themselves to, <laughs> to controlling the lower classes um that being black people immigrants working class people were allowed to do it um again there was very little training there was very little diversity in law enforcement as it evolved um, in the 19th century or excuse me in the 20th century and very little has changed even when we started allowing um people of color black black folks to become law enforcement officers they were relegated just to enforcing the law in their own communities in black communities and inside of the police department were always treated like second class citizens were always different were always discriminated against even by other law enforcement officers which is again still the case so the unfortunately the history of policing is that hasn't changed very much okay it is fundamentally based um and something that is fundamentally done by white men with little to no training whose job it is not to prevent crime but to maintain societal structures and norms to police people's movements and not just all people but poor people black people, working class people to prevent and control their movements in a way that is solely motivated by protecting the property of ruling classes. That is what the history of policing is in America. And I, I think, you know, when we take a step toward the data, that becomes very clear, right? There are 10.5 million arrests each year. Uh, we see 911 being used as sort of the primary tool to raise any kind of social problem. Um, mm -hmm. 911 is a recent institution, but the, the number of calls each year are, are staggering, and often you see police deployment. But all of the arrests that police make, only about 5% are for serious violent crimes, the part one crimes that the FBI defines. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I know that you understanding this and so many others across the country have said, well, one of the things that we need to do just very fundamentally is reduce the contact that police have with people, reduce the way in which people interact with law enforcement and sort of limit or curtail what the consequences of that encounter can be. Um, I think one of the really remarkable parts about your work, no surprise, is that it, it crosses the urban to rural spectrum in a state that, you know, has a deep, deep history of across the urban to rural spectrum controlling and oppressing Black people and the poor. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit so that people understand what that means and in reality and practice and in praxis in North Carolina, for you, you know, what is the work that you're undertaking right now? Mm. So Emancipate and C is committed to ending structural and institutional racism through eliminating mass incarceration, through uh, limiting, um, holding police officers accountable um, until we can get to a place where we abolish law enforcement and the carceral system completely. Um, and standing with justice involved people wherever they are in whatever capacity they are facing. But recently our work has also expanded to not just standing with justice involved people, but all people who, sorry, I lost my thing. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but all people who are facing systemic and institutional racism across the state of North Carolina. And that looks uh, different in rural areas than it does in, in cities. So the tactics that we are using, um, some of them are very high level um, and fundamentally uh, the same, regardless of whether it's an urban or a rural terrain. Uh, for example, um, some of the work that we have been able to do through the, through the help of uh, Vera um, is, is work in some small rural counties in North Carolina, particularly Wilson County, where we have worked to limit the number of people who actually enter 
the justice system physically enter it. So we were able to get um, local law enforcement to agree to use citations in lieu of arrest so that people are not arrested, so that people do not um, so that people do not go into the jail system, need bonds, things like that. Um, because fundamentally, what we know is that uh, criminal justice, the impact of criminal justice, the impact of over-policing, and the intersection of that and poverty and criminalizing the poor is inextricable. So you cannot, you cannot address the problems in our carceral system without simultaneously addressing the criminalization of poverty, which we believe is the underlying, one of the underlying um, drivers of the bail bond system in America. Uh, so we, um, we have, what we're doing is trying to create policies, create relationships with state actors to help them understand the negative impact of putting people inside of the carceral system and the positive benefit of reducing um, law enforcement especially impact with people um, and, and that is really how we're, we're focusing so we started with law enforcement in wilson um, just recently we had this amazing conversation with the district attorney who is uh, over a three county rural prosecutorial district about his office's position on bail and bail reform over sentencing things along that line and um and I think because of the work that so many of us are doing, that conversation was actually very fruitful, where four or five years ago it may not have been. So, so doing that work in North Carolina is about interpersonal relationships, helping humanize the people who are most directly impacted, and then also helping those folks, because law, helping the people see the bigger picture. Because very often people are so um, singularly focused on what happens in their world that they don't understand that other people exist differently. Other people have different relationships with law enforcement and the carceral system. And it is incredibly important to bringing about the abolition that we're talking about bringing about that everybody understand and have empathy for the way the carceral system destroys communities and poor folks. So. Mm -hmm. I don't and even know if I answered your question. I'm sorry. No, you did. <laughs> and, and I'm going to, I'm going to go and, and, you know, I think one step deeper and something that you said, um, you talked about working with all people who have been criminalized, who are made vulnerable to premature death, to poor outcomes, to poor health in the criminal justice system. Um, you know, so much of the conversation right now, rightfully so at last, I think is about the consequences of a system that is fundamentally racist, about how black people, anti-black racism and white supremacy in this country structure everything. Um, I think that for me, what often gets lost as someone who, you know, grew up in a family of working poor people is the way in which an explicit commitment to anti-racism helps all marginalized people. Mm. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, about the way in which I think particularly in smaller cities in rural communities where social proximity is so much more pronounced, we have to approach the work with uh, the the notion and the commitment to the fact that addressing anti-blackness helps all people. Ooh, Jasmine, that is a <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, let's do it. All right. So here here here's what it is. Um, because I think at, at the base of your question, um, for those of us, for for the lay folks and people who are not deeply steeped in this work, is why do black lives matter why do we have to say that black lives matter why can't we just say all lives matter so here here's why folks <laughs> black lives matter because black people in this country in whatever metric you use are at the bottom or among the bottom of any, any metric that you use to value or to determine quality of life, okay? Period. Mm -hmm. That is a true, re and that goes across, that crosses socioeconomic lines, education levels, 
all of that, okay? So the reality is this. If you help, if you get equity for the people at the bottom, and that equity is real, and it is implemented in a way that is transformative, that trickles up. If you help, it not help, if you value with equity the people who are at the bottom of every measurable quality of life standard, everyone benefits. What we and why we have to say explicitly that Black Lives Matter is because so often in this work of reform, what happens is we start out talking about Black folks, Black lives, and then in order to make that conversation palatable for the masses, it gets watered down. It gets it becomes people of color. It becomes uh all this other stuff, any other, you know, all these other, um, all of these other marginalized communities are then lumped in together. And what we've seen happen is that that is a successful tactic, but the support, the change never gets to the base, right? What we know about affirmative action was great, right? In theory, it's perfect. It's a perfect system that can be used to create equity. The problem is that if it stops with white women, it never gets down to the people, to the black people who actually need it. There is real importance and power in talking about black people and the plight of black people in America. Because if we do not, we never get to the root of this illness. We never get to root to the root of this poisonous tree. Because all of this, all of this stems from controlling black bodies. And until we are honest about that conversation, until we are honest about the anti-blackness that undercurrents all of the social ills that we see, we will never fix them. That is why it is important. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. And, you know, I, I want to pick up on another word you said or another phrase, which is creating equity. Um, and again, I think so often when we talk about defending, when we talk about dismantling, it, it lands for some people solely as a process of destruction. Uh, mm -hmm. But in reality, this conversation is really about what happens concurrently, what happens with the reinvestment. It is about a process of creation. Um, so I wonder if you, you can talk about what that means to you. And, and I think as part and parcel of that, what are the other things that we're sort of called to rethink or reimagine or re-understand in this process of creation? So first, I want to say that... Um, the first thing that we have to do, again, is recognize the irrational dogma that we have associated with criminal justice mm -hmm. and the carceral system mm -hmm. and untether our personal sense of safety from the carceral system as it exists. Because those two things have virtually nothing to do with each other. But, and this goes back to the religion um, analogy that I was making earlier, but because we have been so indoctrinated to believe that these two things are inextricable, right? We don't think critically about the systems and what actually the systems are producing. That's the first thing we have to do. And when we do that, then it makes it easier to understand why defunding is not about destruction. It is not about deconstructing something as much as it is about constructing something better, constructing something that is more fruitful. Um, depending on audiences that I'm talking to, I, I create, um, I, I explain this in different ways. Sometimes if, if I'm talking to, you know, middle class, upper middle class people, I'll say this. If you invest in a stock that consistently underperforms, 
consistently underperforms, what do you do? You divest from that stock. You divest from that company, right? Why then with the policing system, a carceral system, a but a policing system in America where crime, according to some folks, is constantly on the rise, nothing has changed, Every, it, you're, you, you feel less safe than you've ever felt before, the response to that is to double down and reinvest in the thing that isn't working. It's absolutely asinine, right? It is insane that we keep investing in a system to protect us from something. And it does, not only does it not protect us, it exacerbates the harm that is caused it makes it worse they become criminals when you're trying to to get rid of crime it's insane um that's the first thing and i think if people just really really unlock themselves and untether their sense of personal safety from law enforcement and think critically about what it is that law enforcement actually produces mm -hmm it's not really hard to do, right? It's not really hard to say, yeah, this isn't working. This is stupid. Why are we still doing this? Um, the other thing I want people to, I, I talk about often when I'm talking about defunding is this. This is not a foreign concept, people. It is <laughs> not a foreign concept, right? It's just because of that irrational dogma, that irrational tethering of your personal safety with law enforcement that it feels so jarring to say. But let me be clear, we live in a country that has <laughs> completely defunded mm -hmm. mental health care, mm -hmm. virtually gutted, and I'll say de defunded, because that's the word we're using, public education. Mm -hmm has virtually defunded, right? Defunded mental health care and access to health. Not just in this country, but in our schools and every place where our children were supposed to see them. Has fundamentally divested from inner city communities. Mm -hmm. We divest all the time, right? We defund all the time. And we do it with little to no fanfare. Mm -hmm. So what I need for people to understand is that defunding the police, and, and while those systems that were defunded fundamentally harmed people and fundamentally harmed us in the long run, the truth of the matter is by defunding law enforcement, ooh, and investing those funds in those, just those four systems that I talked about, where we as a nation have defunded from, just reinvesting in those systems, ultimately minimizes the need for law enforcement at all. Mm -hmm. Because let's be clear, law enforcement is reactionary. Law enforcement reacts to problems. If we take the money that we put into law enforcement for them to react, and invested in people, invested in communities, then what happens is there is less for them to react to because crime is a direct derivative of poverty. Right. So we create a living wage, we can create stable housing, we create um, schools that are actually educating children, all children. We create a health, health system where people can get access to the meds that they need and don't have to make ungodly Sophie's choices about how they're going to function and how they're going to survive. When survivability is equitable, hmm. we don't need law enforcement. I'm just writing down some of your quotes so that I can attribute them to you later on when I am explaining things to people. Um, you know, I, I am thinking of as a book recommendation, right? James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, um, and the notion, right? Something you're saying that sure, historically, people have asked for police 
because they were experiencing social instability and crime in their communities. But at the same time, they were also asking for parks, for education, for housing, for healthcare. And the, the response, the thing that people have said, yes, okay, you can have this, has always been more policing and more enforcement, particularly in Black communities, particularly in poor communities. Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that we know that, you know, our, our decades long experiment with mass incarceration has had very quickly diminishing returns on reducing crime and really has only ever addressed property crime, which goes mm -hmm. back to your point about what the system was set up to do in the first place. Right. Um, but these, this bigger budget question, right, the idea of what gets invested in, what gets divested from, it means that your, your local context also has to be understood in the context of a state legislature, of mm -hmm. a federal government, of all of these other sources of funding. Policing is a local institution, but it is structured by investments in lots of different places. Mm -hmm. So because you work at so many levels and in so many capacities, I wonder if you can just give us some thoughts about how your work with the legislature in North Carolina interacts with the work in Wilson and Raleigh-Durham and other parts of the state. So um, it's funny, Jasmine, that you would that you would ask that question because here's the here's what I am finding more and more often as I have these intersectional conversations, right, or multi-jurisdictional conversations. In this moment where everybody's like, how did we get here? We need this, right? Uh, which is awesome that everybody's, everybody's uh, awake and realizing that, that something's got to give. Um, I'm so sorry, y'all. Hold on. That's okay. We can still hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have these little, my ears are little or something. They must be like abnormally little. I can't hold on to these stupid ear pods. Anyway. Um, what, I, what I'm finding is that everyone now wants to point the finger. If I'm talking to legislators, they want to say to me, well, why aren't you talking to district attorneys who are overcharging? If I'm talking to district attorneys, they're saying to me, well, why aren't you talking to city councils that are over investing in, in, police, in local law enforcement? If I'm talking to local law enforcement, they're saying, yeah, well, our hands are tied because, the you know, talking to local, local law, local local legislative bodies about police accountability, they're saying to me, yeah, but our hands are tied by the state legislature and the laws that they create. Um, and my response to all of this, and all of that is, guess what? All of those entities and systems work to create and uphold this racist and corrupt system. So all of you have a role in fixing it, right? Um, and it is important for us to not, everyone wants a quick answer. Everyone wants to say, well, if so-and-so just did this one thing, it would fix everything. That's garbage. And, and that's, that's a, and in no other, in no other instance, is that a, even a, a plan of attack for a systemic problem that anyone would endorse. It's insane. There is work at every single level that needs to be done to eradicate the harms of this system, hmm. period. That is a, like a hard stop. So when I'm talking to the General Assembly, I say, yeah, you're right. I should be talking to district attorneys. Guess what? I am talking to them. But <laughs> right now, I'm talking to you. And I want to focus on what you can do, how you can change the laws in North Carolina on a state level that make um, the requirements for law enforcement certification much more difficult, much more rigorous, that make um, how you can pass legislation that get SROs out of my kids' schools. And if they're there, you can pass legislation through that certification process that says that if you are an SRO, then you have to have, I don't know, 10 credits, uh, 10 college credits in child psychology, right? You have to have 10 college credits in uh, education. Um, you have to have in, in education administration, if that's what you're going to do. You have to know something about the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's them for on a state level. Then on a county level, you know, I'm saying you all have, you determined what, um, how your sheriffs interact with people on the streets. You, you determine who sits in your jails, how your, how your jails are, what kind of safety measures are put in place at your jails to protect people who are detained there. On a 
city level, I'm talking about law enforcement. You can't tell me that you have a crazy chief of police and that your hands are tied because you have nothing, you can't do anything about it, but the city council hires and fires. Like there is work um, that every, a tremendous amount of work on every level of jurisdiction in, inside of the state that needs to be done in order to get at the fundamental root of the problem of policing. So yeah, I'm holding everybody accountable, whether they <laughs> want to be held accountable or not. Yeah. Um, I know you are. Yes, thank you. I have a meeting with the DA tomorrow. There you <laughs> go. The other DA the next day and the council <laughs> the following day. I'm busy. Answer my question. Um, I know we have we have just two minutes before Ben rounds everyone up and, and pulls folks into breakouts to, to think expansively about justice and safety and reinvestment. So I wonder, Dawn, if, if in the last couple of minutes, what you can do um, is challenge people to, to, to be uncomfortable um, and challenge people before they go into those breakouts. You know, what are, what are we called to do in this moment in our history? Okay, here's what you're called to do. Here's your homework. When I, when I, when I get a chance to teach, when I, whenever we get back to being able to have one-on-one -on -one trainings in a community, I always leave people with homework. Here's your homework, folks. First of all, do the hard work of untethering your sense of personal safety from law enforcement. Once you do that part, man, the rest of it is so much easier. I want you to think about places and things that we ask law enforcement to do right now, like solve domestic problems, um, get find your children, get your get kids to go to school, um, check in on old people, do well checks when somebody is all of the things that we ask law enforcement to do right now. I want you to come up with lists of other agencies who are much better equipped to do those things. Right? And then you those are the and then think about how we take money away from law enforcement and give it to the people that are really capable of doing those things, right? Who are capable of, of doing those those human needs, meeting the human needs of our citizenry um, without needing a gun and escalating situations, right? Because that's that's what we can do. Like literally, why do you need a police officer to do a damn report at a car accident, right? Why does it not make more sense that somebody with a training in, say, car insurance is the person that shows up? <laughs> uh, so let, let's do that. Let's think about other systems that we can invest in that are not law enforcement, that could, but that could serve the same role that we ask law enforcement to do effectively and efficiently. There's the work. There it is. All right, Ben, I think passing back to you now for to take folks into that work. Yeah, that's a that's a perfect lead in. And, and thank you, Dawn um, and Jasmine, too, for for sharing today. I feel like I was feverishly writing down um, my call to actions and, and my my notes and takeaways from today. So thank you. Um, for everyone here today, we have about 15 minutes left and what we'd love to do is take what was just shared um, and, and think about it as, as it applies to your community. Um, so we're putting a, a short um, sort of survey for you to kind of take notes as you're in these groups. There'll be four or five people in each breakout and we hope that you'll think critically and creatively about exactly what Don was referencing. Um, things like the uh, car insurance expert showing up at a car accident. Um, I think that's a wonderful example that I hadn't considered before, um, but I'm sure y'all can come up with um, a bunch more of them. And what we'd love to do is, is after today, put those together and, and give them back to you um, so you can put into practice both your own ideas and the ideas of others. So um, give me just a moment and I'll break you into these groups and then we'll reconvene in about um, 15 minutes and um, say our goodbyes.
All right. Um, the only thing I would say is I want to thank you all for, for um, coming here and trying to do this hard work. I want to thank you for being open to hearing um, a different way to think about defunding law enforcement. Most importantly, what I want you to do is if you learned anything here, if you heard any concept here that resonates with you to help you feel more comfortable about defunding law enforcement, tell six other people and then force them to tell six other people. Because really what we have to do is convince people, convince the masses, that defunding is not as scary as they think it is. And not only is it not as scary as they think it is, it will ultimately benefit everyone. That's what we need people to learn. So your homework is tell five people what you learned here today, whatever it was that resonated with you, um, share it with at least five other people, then encourage them to share it with five other people because this is about changing hearts and minds. That's what we're trying to do here today. Thank y'all.